children, consent, capacity and competence. I'm Dr. Krisha Patel and I'm a forensic medical examiner working in police custody and a sexual offences examiner working in the SARCs, the Sexual Assault Referral Centre. The objectives of this mini lecture are to understand the law on obtaining consent from children and young people. I will start with a very brief introduction to the legal system in England, and then I'll talk about important case law, which is Gillick competency. Then I'll talk about important legislation, the Mental Capacity Act 2005, and the Family Law Reform Act 1969. The target audience of this webinar are healthcare practitioners working with children. So let's start with a very brief introduction to the legal system in England. The legal system in England and Wales is generally the same. The legal system in Scotland and Northern Ireland are slightly different and the structure of the legal system is also different. So the two main sources of law I want to talk about in this mini lecture are domestic legislation, and by that I mean Acts of Parliament, so the Mental Capacity Act is an act of parliament and it's an example of domestic legislation. And then I also want to talk about common law, which is also called case law, it's also called judge-made law, and it's also called judicial precedent. And the case of Victoria Gillick versus West Norfolk and Wisbeck Health Authority from the 1980s is an example of common law. And that's the common law which created the concept of Gillick competence. So when it comes to domestic legislation or acts of parliament, parliament are the lawmakers in this country and the majority of English law is actually covered by legislation which is passed by parliament. Case law, on the other hand, is something that is developed over the years and has been developed over hundreds of years. And the reason we need case law and judicial precedent is because sometimes the legislation or the acts of parliament are just not very clear and the judge has to then create laws which then clarify the situation. And over time, this case law becomes codified into statutes and new acts of parliament are made and new legislation is made and the case law is incorporated into that. And these two sources of law are both important in this mini lecture and the domestic legislation isn't more important than common law and common law is not, in, not more important than domestic legislation. And other sources of law also exist, so things like EU law would be an example of another source of law. This webinar really only applies to those who work in England and as I've already mentioned, the laws of England are generally the same as the laws of Wales. The legal system is slightly different in Northern Ireland and Scotland. So very briefly, I want to talk about the structure of the court system in England. To simplify this diagram, I've circled here the higher courts and the ones that sit below it are the lower courts. So the higher court would be a high court, Court of Appeal and UK Supreme Court. And the UK Supreme Court is the highest law of the land in the UK. Then you've got your lower courts here, your Crown, Magistrates, County and your Family Courts. And the higher courts are allowed to make judgments and, and that is binding on the courts that sit below them. So if the UK Supreme Court makes a decision, which becomes judicial precedent, it has to be followed by the court that sit below the UK Supreme Court. So Court of Appeal, High Court and all these lower courts here. And the important case of Victoria Gillick was heard first in the High Court and then also in the Court of Appeal and then in what was then the House of Lords, which then is now called the UK Supreme Court. And so this very important law that was created by the judges in this very landmark case is something that has to be followed by all the other courts and um, that's why it makes very important judicial precedent. So let's start with a definition of a child. A child is someone up until their 18th birthday. And that is what is stated in the Children Act 1989 and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of a Child. So when somebody turns 18, they become an adult. They're allowed to do all the things that adults are allow allowed to do, such as gamble and take out credit cards and mortgages. They're allowed to smoke and drink alcohol. 
that goes from a child to an adult on their 18th birthday. So this slide is really making the point that the law changes on somebody's 16th birthday. So between the ages of zero and 15, the important law that applies is called Gillick competency. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the later webinar. And that's the very important landmark case from the 1980s, applying from basically from birth up until somebody's 16th birthday. And on somebody's 16th birthday, the law changes overnight. So we move from Gillick competency case law to two important pieces of legislation that start to take effect. So the first one is the Family Law Reform Act, which says that 16 year olds can consent to medical, surgical or dental treatment. That's actually legislation says that 16 year olds can consent to medical, surgical, dental treatment if it's in the opinion of the medical practitioner that they are capable of understanding the nature and the consequences of the, the treatment. The other piece of legislation that starts to take effect on somebody's 16th birthday is the Mental Capacity Act, of course, which um, says there's a presumption of capacity when somebody turns 16. And of course, the Mental Capacity Act applies until somebody eventually passes away. So from 16, plus all the way up until death, the Mental Capacity Act is the key legislation that applies. And the other important thing to remember though, is that when it comes to children between the ages of zero and up until their 18th birthday, parents or people with parental responsibility, which might be the local authority, for example, and the courts can also give consent for the child to undergo a treatment. So. That is regardless of whether the child is under 16 and Gillick competent or not. And regardless of whether the child is over 16, but under 18 and has capacity or not. So parents, those with parental responsibility and courts can give consent to their child up until their 18th birthday, if it's deemed in their best interests. So let's talk about competence or capacity. The words are often interchanged when we're thinking about the terms as legal terms, which is legal competence and legal capacity. Legal competence is something that's sort of defined in the Gillick competency case law and legal capacity is something that's defined in the legislation that is the Mental Capacity Act 2005. So we ought to talk about competency in children who are under 16 and talk about capacity for children who are over 16 and for adults as well. But of course, people do interchange the words when we're talking about it generally, rather than in terms of the legal definition of competence and capacity. So that was a brief introduction. And um, just to summarise, I briefly talked about the legal system in England. Then I mentioned the important case law, which is the landmark case of Gillick versus West Norfolk and Wisbeck Health Authority, which is the concept we use when we're thinking about children who are under 16, and when we're thinking about guess, gaining consent from children who are under 16. And then we consider the Mental Capacity Act and the Family Law Reform Act when children turn 16. In the next session, we're gonna talk about Gillick competence in a bit more detail and talk a little bit more about the, the judgment and the, what the case actually involved.